Sarah Wilson, welcome. Thank you. I want you to take us on a bit of a journey from, you were born in New York, yeah? Is no. Right? No? Why, no. Did, why it, does that come up somewhere? It's come up on some weird website. I don't, or Santa Cruz, I think it came up, which I, I studied at. I New York at. too. Yeah, right. Where were you born then? Yeah, oh, I was born in Canberra. <laughs> yeah, I know, New York to Canberra. Well, um, pot's legal there now, so it's a, yeah, you know, yeah, on yeah. the cutting edge for Australians. I actually grew up, though, on the outskirts of Canberra in the country. Okay. Um, so I moved out there when I was seven. And family? Um, yeah, my family are based still in that area um, and sort of all over the place. Big, big family. How so, big? Oh, I'm the eldest of six kids. Yeah, nice. Um, and... Yeah, we grew because because we grew up in the country. There was nothing going on. When I say the country, that sounds like there was probably a nice town and there was stuff going on, maybe ponies and pony club. Nut. No, there was none of that. It was the middle of the drought, and we were living a subsistence living Damn. life. Yeah, um, by choice or um, well, Dad's always explained it as they just were broke, and it was the only place they could afford to live. So we had goats for milk and meat, and. Um, and sort of everything was recycled, including the house, which was off the back of a truck. It was a cyclone-proof house that Dad Classy. found. I don't know how he found these things before the internet. But um, so, yeah, we lived out there. So there was really very little in- entertainment and certainly no friends around. And so it was me and my brothers just kind of... Doing your thing. Doing our thing, yeah, running yeah. wild, basically. What did Dad do for a living? Well, he rode a motorbike into Canberra each day and he yeah. was in the public service. Yeah, as you Had were been, back then. Yeah. 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 Nice. Yeah. From there to high-powered media editor to health influencer, <laughs> the milestones, because I know there's a, a whole lot of, you know, I, I suppose formative things in there for you, mental health, a bunch of things. Just mm. for those that don't know your story, and I know a lot, do that listen to this podcast, but for those that don't, take us just on a little bit of a journey. Yeah, okay. Um, cut me off if it gets too long-winded. Sure. Um, so I, yes, I say I grew up in, in Canberra, but then travelled from quite a young age. and um, To run away? Yeah, a little, actually, yeah. a little. Um, more kids arrived and at 17 I moved out of home and um, and 18 I went overseas and just and just travelled and earned some money um, and had all kinds of adventures. I suppose I was reasonably wild in many ways. Um, I like had, truly wild or just reasonably wild? <laughs> um, I've only realised in recent years, I'm now 46, and people when they hear the various stories that I got up to, I quite can't match it with the polished, shiny face they see, you know, in the press shots. But um, I hitchhiked around. I lived on the streets of Paris for some time because I I had everything stolen. I was mugged and left with nothing, no passport, no clothes, nothing, literally what I was wearing and that was it. Um, And I would, I don't know, meet up with randoms and go mountain bike riding with them in Spain because they were heading in that direction and I'd sleep in the car with them and uh, lived with kind of would find myself living with people, sharing a bed with them, a single bed, you know, and have and, and then these friendships have continued. I'm still friends with these people, you know. Um, so I I lived that way and then I went to Santa Cruz, which I think comes up in my bio as me being born there as well as New York. Yeah. Um, there, was, there was bits of me born You're everywhere. Messiah. Yeah. <laughs> Multiple places. That's right. And I studied um, I studied over there and I-, I What did you study? Oh, um, it was philosophy, but essentially it was it was a sort of with a quantum physics skew, um, mm-hmm. yeah, and women's studies, which was very popular back in mm-hmm. the early nineties. Um, Jermaine Greer era. Yeah, 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 that's right. Cindy Sherman and 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 everything. And I was involved in women's politics and from quite a young age. I used to be the women's officer at my university and and. Um, was outspoken on that kind of stuff. Did that come from your mum or was just no, 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 no. Mum's super shy, yeah, really wow. super shy, and um, often I think has said to me, "I don't know where you came from." <laughs> um, <laughs> Have you got other sisters? I've got one sister. She's is eleven she, years younger. Is she as strong in personality? No, 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 no. She's mouthy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, the two of us are quite mouthy, but no, no. She's my entire family are chilled. Yeah. And I just came out the way I did. So um, 
I bossed them. I bossed them around. I sort of, if, and I, it worked well for all involved. You know, they're my best friends, my brothers and my sister. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've done a lot of travelling together, and we spend our holidays together. Yeah, you know, cool. that's what we do. We go and sit in the bush together and camp and. Have they all done traditional things, marriage, kids, or mixed? They don't get married, but they've got partners and kids. Okay. Yeah. None of them have got married. One of them has to, because he's got a Slovakian partner, and to be able to go and spend time over there, they got married in a registry. Yeah, interesting. And drank some vodka, some Slovakian vodka. <laughs> but none of us were invited, you know. Seriously? We, oh, we saw it was, we saw a Skype photo of the registry office, <laughs> you know. Um, but that was, no, no, we don't go for traditional type stuff. Um, and I suppose that's what we've got in common. We, we, we don't like fuss and... Mm. You know, um, we still kind of live very simply. They all, they, we, all of us ride bikes, my parents included. They ride a bike everywhere. Um, push bikes? Push bikes. My, yeah. Push bikes, yeah. And um, all engaged in one way or another in the environmental movement. And we all have all our lives. And Damn. they all work one way or another in that realm. So um, that's uncanny. That yeah. an entire family. Yeah. Well, Other than a family that's grown up as a farm and stay on a farm, but to everyone to yeah. scatter and still be focused on oh, something. Oh, you should see our WhatsApp um, family group at the moment with everything that's going on. Oh, I can yeah. imagine. It, it's pretty feral. Yeah. <laughs> um, study, so, yeah, Santa study, Cruz. Santa Cruz. And I, I got very, very sick over there. So I've had a bunch of autoimmune diseases, Hashimoto's, which is a thyroid issue, um, and I developed that in Santa Cruz. Um, what age? I was 21. Yeah. So I got Graves disease, which is a sped up thyroid disease. And at the same time I was diagnosed with bipolar. So I got extremely unwell. Um, I couldn't turn up to school and, and my quantum physics professor, who I actually mentioned in my book about anxiety first, We Make the Beast Beautiful, he actually came and got me and sort of um, I then I then had someone come and collect me, and I had to go back to Australia. But diagnosed, obviously. Diagnosed, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I thought that might have just been American overplay. So when I got back to Australia, I obviously went and tried to get some help and shopped around various psychiatrists, hoping I'd find someone who'd say I wasn't bipolar, and, mm. um, and eventually had to accept it. So that was quite a, a very full-on journey at the time. Is it a genetic thing, bipolar? Or to a is certain it- extent, yeah. yeah. It's an evolutionary thing. So um, it's really interesting, actually, with certain uh, mental disorders, such as obsessive-compulsive disorder and um and bipolar, and I think also to a certain extent schizophrenia, they exist in the same percentage of the population around the world. Over about, history, yes. Yeah. Over history yeah. and in different parts in the world. So, um, and it's hard to say over history, but they've they've been able to track behaviours in various populations and identify them as bipolar behaviour. Mm-hmm. So it's been about 1.2 to 1.4% of the population anywhere in the world will be bipolar, for instance. And they say that that happens because it's an evolutionary quirk that keeps um, a community safe and vigilant. So it's the bipolar person. What's has- the science there? How so? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, it's a, it's a basically an extrapolation or a correlation, I suppose, but this is what's been suggested by anthropologists. Mm. Um, when... By, I can use the example of obsessive compulsive disorder because it's a little bit more straightforward. It's always focused in and around either safety or hygiene. Mm. Anyone who's got the condition, their obsession um, and their compulsion is a base around those two things. Um, it doesn't tend to deviate. So turning off the stove, having to wash your hands, that kind of thing. Mm. And um, there was a study done by Diane Fozzi in the 1960s, I think it was, with chimps. And she identified chimps that possessed kind of OCD qualities. And they sat on the edge of the group. They tended to be hypervigilant. They'd be awake at night. They'd hear noises. Um, they're obsessed with cleanliness and mm. the cleanliness of the clan. She removed those from the group and the and the clan died out in six months. Damn. Yeah. So that's um, some of the thinking around the, the use. The use, yeah. yeah. And so that was a big part of, you know, I'm jumping well ahead here because I'm meant to be giving you a potted history. That's okay. Um, but when I wrote First We Make the Beast Beautiful, which actually was a bit of a lifetime journey and actu- the actual research um, beginning to end was pretty much seven years. Mm. Um, 
that was sort of why I went into writing the book and reframing these disorders as a positive, as a superpower, um, because um, they're, they're deemed a disorder today but weren't always. And another example is they've identified that shaman and community leaders in ancient cultures were um, bipolar. Um, they possessed an ability to see uh, very, very broadly mm. and to be able to encapsulate concepts yeah. and drill them down with a, a certain form of excitement and leadership and exuberance and forthrightness. Um, and, you know, could also think of crazy ideas and think outside the square and be able to distance themselves from the, the I guess, the minutiae of life. Mm. Um, and, you know, if you have a look now, they've, they've identified that around about 70% of world leaders during wartime were bipolar. So Winston Churchill being probably the most prominent example. Yeah. And they're not great in times of everyday peace oh, but, going through the motions. Yeah. But when shit hits the fan, you want a bipolar leader, right? And so that's where the thinking comes around that these conditions exist as an evolutionary quirk Think, for yeah. a reason to keep us um, progressing forward as a human race um, and also safe and, and you know, Safe and, and clean. Yeah, but I can't imagine as a 21-year-old you were thinking like that, that the stigma that goes oh, with yeah, and that's right. OCD or bipolar is horrific. And, like, truthfully, like, I'm going to Austria later this month for a, a mate's wedding and his fiance, her mum had OCD her an entire life and the stress of going from America to Austria, she literally took her life on Boxing Day. Gosh. Like, it was too much it for It was her. too much for her. Yeah. So there I, I I get like I love the philosophy that you're talking mm. about that we need to say these people are are different in the most brilliant way, whereas society says they're on the spectrum or they're crazy people or mm. she's mad, she's up, she's down, I don't know which person I'm gonna get. And and that must have been super hard as a as yeah. a young woman. Yeah. If we're talking twenty five years ago, the world was a very different place, um, in terms of talking about this kind of stuff. It was the beginning of that whole Prozac Nation kind of thing mm. where we medicalized. We thought we found the fix. Mm. Um and so you gave people drugs. It was a repetition of the nineteen fifties, you know, um, in many ways. But you're right. It's it. I I took on that stigma for most of my life, and and it didn't serve me. I, I got annoyed with it. I got bored with that storyline. It didn't work. It didn't sit with me at a philosophical, spiritual, soul level. Mm. And you know, I've spoken to. I mean, when I toured that book, and I'd see young people at the front of the audience, people who were much the same age as I was when I was diagnosed, and they're at the front, and I know they're type. They're a type. They're full on. They're absolutely they want to get everything out of life and and as a result um or not as a result but i think related um they've often got some kind of mental disorder and they'll put up their hands and they'll want really specific kind of therapy um, yeah therapy that's <laughs> right um and i'll say to them do you when you go home at night and you look in the bathroom mirror on your own or when you're lying in bed staring at the ceiling do you genuinely think that you have a problem do you genuinely think this is a disorder and they go no and i said do you feel that It'll all come to something. It's all for a reason. Mm. And they go, yes. And I'm like, ride with that. Hang on to it. Life's going to be shit for a while until you work it all out. Yeah. And I often have to say to young people, sheer years on the planet sometimes is the only salve. It's sad, isn't it? Like, it is. Case to it 46 isn't. or 51. Like, I, I reckon at 51, I'm, I'm where I would have liked to be when I was 21. I know. Oh, I know. It's like, oh, my God, now I've got to really stay alive long. I've started behaving because I go, now I've got to actually capitalise on this that's new right. wisdom. Like live like a mofo. Live like a mofo. You know, mofo. that's my, my philosophy <laughs> now. Um, so, yes, anyway, so I'm um, 21, got really sick, stalled for a while, couldn't leave the house for a year, eventually got better. During this time, I was dating a guy who was in the food industry. He owned a restaurant in Canberra that was did really well. I waitressed there at the... The day I turned 18, I went in there and got a job because I just decided that's where I had to work. Because he was a cute guy or just the no, restaurant was good? the restaurant was, was great. It yeah. was very innovative and it was quite new at the time. What was the restaurant? It was called Cafe Della Piazza. It was there for like 10 years. Cool name. Yeah. Um, and 
it was lots of fun and many of my friends I know from working with them in that time. Um, and this boyfriend, he was a legend, 10 years older, um, and we had a great time. But he and I did lots of food stuff, wine stuff, and ended up travelling the world. So during that time there was a bit of that going on and I got interested in food and wine. I eventually moved to Melbourne. I fronted up to what is now called Stella Magazine, but it was mm-hmm. a Sunday magazine back then. It was based in Melbourne. Did work experience. Um, at the end of the week the editor said, well, why are you, who are you <laughs> and what do you think of a magazine? And I said, well, I think your food and wine pages are terrible. The industry talks about it, they're shit, you know. And yeah. she went, all right, well, come back on Monday and tell me what I should do about it. So I went home and learnt Quark. Some of your younger listeners won't know what I'm talking about. Um, the internet was not invented at this stage. So um, Quark was where it was at. So I learnt Quark and re- reviewed a bunch of restaurants and redesigned the pages and basically went, this is, this is what it's got to look like. And she went, all right, you've got the job and gave the pages to the designer. So that's how I started in journalism. Um, and Which then I, was what, late, late 20s, early 30s? I was 23. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I missed the gap from 21 with the boyfriend. You were still with the boyfriend. Yeah, he then followed me to Melbourne okay. in the end. Yeah. Damn. And so I was at the Herald Sun and then I started writing for the opinion pages and shared a page with Andrew Bolt. I just did it for free, mm. right? I just send off these rants and they'd publish them. Eventually they gave me a regular column on a Friday. It was me and Andrew Bolt. Um, I would know exactly why I was there. I was a counterpoint. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so then at 29, um, I got approached about editing Cosmo and so I moved to Sydney and I became editor of Cosmo at 29. Never read the magazine in my life, had zero interest in fashion. Um, How did you do that? Like is it's because I've known you for quite a long time and I know you from a yoga mat. Yeah, that's right. You know, the and I always thought this, the disconnect between being the editor of that magazine that was all about beauty and handbags and yeah. superficiality and I, truly. And, and then and seeing me and Downward Dog, yeah. Down with dog and riding your bike and consuming nothing and secondhand clothes and yeah did you just do it and the joy came from just doing a good job exactly it was um it was a challenge you know it was a job and so therefore I was able to do it without getting caught up in the politics and mm. the the stuff that can drag you down in a workplace like that which you know the obvious things that people would assume about a workplace like that um And so I was actually able to probably bring fresher ideas because I wasn't of that world. And I, there's, you know, there's, I presume there were girls, other girls like me out there, you know. (laughs) Increasingly so. Well, yes. Now, now more so than back then, I think. I think it's only just starting to happen. Um, So, yeah, it was interesting. It was interesting. It was a job, you know, and I loved it and I gave everything to it and probably too much. So, at 34, I burnt myself out for a bunch of reasons. Um, Lots of doubt and uncertainty and my thyroid had whipped itself from being um, hyperactive to hypoactive. So, I basically killed my thyroid. And I, Through lack of sleep, yeah. drinking, yeah. stress, yeah. all the usual and a, things. And a, tox- yeah. a very toxic boyfriend at the time. Um, who, there are plenty of them around. Yeah, there was a few. Um, Especially living in Bondi. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He, uh, he kind of personified all of that at the time. Um, taught me a lot. Um, but um, so that was really, it was just, it was tricky. Mm. And I think, you know, my, my inexperience and vulnerabilities, it, it all sort of caught up on me. And, um, and then, and then once you have a sort of a hormonal um, weakness, it does mean that stress has a bigger impact and then your hormones play up further and you go down this kind of spiraling hole Mm. and um, you can't catch yourself by the time you're on that spiral. So uh, the thyroid stuff um, really flared up to the point where I reached a point where I couldn't walk or work for almost a year. And so I moved to Byron Bay because I lost everything. But stop it because I I listened to you talk about this last night and – I never realised this about you. Like how much weight did you put on? Like 40 pounds or? Yeah, it was, I went, yeah, it was, I put on 15 to 18 kilos, kilos. in a couple of weeks. Lost your hair. Yeah. First of all, I lost lots of weight. Everyone thought I was anorexic. So in the lead up to all of this and I was still at Cosmo, I people didn't recognise me. I was so thin. And then all of a sudden I sort of I actually put on more than 50, it was 20 kilos in total. Um and so, but I'd gone from underweight, um, so I was about fifteen above what I should be, and um, and yeah, the hair fell out, my nails fell out. I 
was diagnosed with premature menopause at 34. Um, perimenopause. Mm, perimenopause, yeah. exactly. And, um, you know, the doctors didn't know what they were talking about, but my periods had stopped. All of my hormones had just flatlined. Mm. Um, and by the time I... By the time I sort of went to a doctor and the proper specialist, um, they said that I had the worst case of Hashimoto's, this particular disease. It's that such an exotic-sounding disease. Yeah, it's not. I it's know, shit. I'm sure. <laughs> anyone who's listening, and I'm sure, look, you know, there's uh, anyone who's ha- interested in health and interestingly a big part of Hashimoto's is unfortunately, or not unfortunately actually, sorry, I should say, um, a a sort of a, a sort of non-negotiable in many ways is that we often have to get our protein from meat. Yeah. So you know, meat Good meat us. eaters, meat eaters. Um, there's probably a few of them out there who do have Hashimoto's or know someone with it, um, and it's not fun. Um, so yeah, by I, I was a wreck of a, a human. I For was a full year. Yeah, yeah, stripped of absolutely everything in my life. Money. Um, it's amazing when you've got a chronic illness how friends disappear. And mm. I understand. It gets boring. It really does. A few core friends who were there for me for the whole lot, I will forever be indebted to them. Mm. They are very special friends. And they're not always the ones you expect, you know. Yeah, they're not always your closest friends that come forward. That's kind of um, a common story. Eventually, and look, I'm very lucky, Paul, that I was – Born with some kind of tenacity, that means that it probably landed me in this shit in the first place because yeah. I go too hard and don't stop. Yeah. Um, and then it also, but it also means that I will, f- I generally fight back. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, because you were suicidal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've had a, and I'm open about this because I've written about it. Um, there's been several suicide attempts in my life, and it's a funny thing to talk about because I think there's this perception that um, it's a, well, it's more that it's sort of, um, it's more of an inevitability. It's not like there's this sudden decision that you make. Mm. It's just more that I had exhausted every single angle for getting myself out of the position I was in, or at least in my head, because the thoughts were obsessive, they were going around in circles. I'd tried everything, everything, and I had thoughts coming in, thoughts going out, and I was going around in circles, and the net result was zero movement. I mm. basically went numb in the end. I get it. And I, I, sleeplessness is also a really big thing with this because it can take you to a spot where you, you literally don't think straight. You're subhuman. And there's a, there's a, it's just, it's a relief to know that there's one last passage out of yeah. here. You know, and that's that's what's happened for me each time. It's not like it's this dramatic, right, I'm going to do do, do this. Yeah. Um, it's just that you, I describe it in my book as you reach the inevitable cul-de-sac of your existence. Yeah, it's the last option. There's no choice. Yeah. There's no choice. And it's a relief and there's a peacefulness. Now, for me, I was fortunate enough to have had probably the tenacity, but also philosophical and spiritual kind of grounding to know, to recognise what was going on when I got to that point. Can I ask you about that? Because it's super important. And and I've said this to a lot of people for those that don't meditate or don't have a spiritual practice, that it all sounds all wanky and very Bondi or LA or Santa Mm -hmm. Cruz Mm -hmm. or whatever you want to say, but how important it is to those friends like you that, that really have hit the the absolute rock bottom that perhaps the only thing that saved them was the fact that they had that discipline and you really don't know that you need it until you actually need it. Yeah. Can you, like having lived through it, do you think it was such a critical part of of why you're still sitting here? Absolutely, and several times over. Mm. It saved me. It absolutely saved me. Um, And that and a couple of other things as well, which I'm sure we'll get to, but... um, yeah, with, with meditation, it, it basically, you've probably heard this, you water the roots, enjoy the fruit, Yeah, you know. And I, love it. I also point out in First We Make the Beast Beautiful that when you are in a really heightened state of anxiety, when you're in the middle of it and yeah. you're just not coping, uh, meditation doesn't work, as in it's just too hard, you know. Um, but isn't that part of the... That's the, Well, the, the point the, is you do the meditation when... Th- when the rest of the hardest. time, yeah. Well, well when, it's, when it's hardest, I will say this, it, when you're in a really heightened state of anxiety, mm. you know, um, it's a bridge too far. 
And I okay. don't see uh, my salve in those moments is to walk instead yeah. and um, to literally move just get out of the house and, and walk. breathe and walk. Yeah, yeah get you it. need simple solutions that yeah. are very accessible. And I've found that meditating when I'm really bad is not. It, just it, takes it you makes it worse. Down. Yeah, yeah. I get that. And but the point is, is you do the meditation the rest of the time as a maintenance thing. Yeah. Um, st- stabilize. I describe having a mental illness as carrying around a shallow bowl of water for the rest of your life. Right. You are charged, and when you're an A-type anxious person, um, you kind of rise to this kind of direction in, in many ways. You have a responsibility. I love responsibility. Mm. It's like I have fire up to it, you know. Yeah. So you have a responsibility to carry it around and keep it stable because if you don't, it starts to slosh and then, of course, the momentum gets more and more and it's out of control and you end up spilling it all over yourself and everyone around you mm. and you've got to keep going back to the source. Got it. So stability, as boring as it is, and I know a lot of people roll their eyes at it, stability is actually so vital. It's everyone wants stability. Even yeah. the craziest, freest people on the planet. Like if you follow those people that do nothing but travel mm. without money, the ones that well, are that's just kind dirt of me. bags. That- <laughs> Nomads, I like Nomads. to call our type. They still have routine. They still get up oh. and they make their cup of coffee. They You're do absolutely that. right. Yeah. So it's just a different form of it. It's just not as structured as those that are. Choose your routine. Choose just your don't routine. be imprisoned by other people's notion of routine. Yeah, is, is the is the deal. So yeah, and meditation is is one that is very freedom enabling. You mm. know, um, you can do it anywhere. You can you 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 own your stability. Yeah. You know? What do you do? What sort of practice? I do the Vedic style. Yeah, um, twice a day. Yeah, yeah. I try to. Um, I don't. I also don't remain rigid about it because mm. rigidity is not going to help me. Yeah, um, and that's part of the wisdom, right? Again, sheer years on the planet. You start to work out that you don't have to stick to any of these rules. Mm. It's got to be a choice. It starts to become a charming thing, mm. you know. And for me, I don't meditate because I have to or I should. I, I just can't work with shoulds. I never have. You know, if I see a wet paint sign, do not touch, I'll I will touch it. it. I get I'm that it. person. So um, I I find that, yeah, if, if I, it feels right to do it. Then do it. And I do have little phrases in my head, which you've probably heard before, surrender your preference. Mm. You know, sometimes you do need to surrender preference to actually have expansiveness and a better experience and a bigger life. Yeah. So I remind myself of that when I go, oh, I can't be bothered. Um, so I have little things, little my little approaches that will push me and test me and en- engage and enlarge me. But So with the meditation, um, and I think you've listened to the podcast I did with somebody in the States recently, uh, being really bad at meditation is also a boon, right? So mm. I've got a frenetic mind and it is hard to calm myself down. So this is this is sort of almost the, the flip side to it's okay if you can't meditate when you're super agitated. Mm. However, having an agitated experience experience in meditation is not that bad because the discipline of meditation is is really in the bringing the mind back to the mantra or the breath or the candlelight or whatever it is that you yeah. use, the sound of the waves. And it's the bringing back, that retraining of that muscle of the brain over and over okay. again yeah. that actually creates that stability, that expansiveness in your, your viscera that that you then take out into the rest of your life and you suddenly start to see it play out mm. in the rest of your life, reflected, like you start to make decisions that are super calm and things don't bother you as much. And when you get to the existential cul-de-sac of your life, you can find some opening and awareness that can save you. Yeah, so um, when you're a bad meditator, you have to do that coming back a lot more. I than reckon a Zen most person. of us are, and particularly those of us that have that crazy monkey mind. Yeah, and those that of was us who need it, the, the, who need it the most, and yeah. that's what everyone says to me. It's torture. My mind doesn't stop. What's the point? I go. That is the point. That is the point. You actually just let it happen, and you do nothing about it for twenty minutes. Yeah, other than just be really gentle. Yeah, be gentle. Um, the, the the word that I also use on that podcast is uh, sukshma. You know, sukshma yeah. is a is a Sanskrit word that essentially means effortlessly, gently, and with a certain amount of kind of curious kind of, oh, yeah, let's see mm. where this goes, you know. And I love that aspect of it because th- there's less rules around what I should and shouldn't be doing. It's like, hey, let's, mm. just, let's just be chill with this and see what happens, you know. Yeah. And, yes, yeah, I find my frenetic mind quite amusing. Yeah, and the less rule thing I think is a big one. Like I've I've had this battle with 
partying and alcohol for my for 25 years. Yeah. And I recently read a book called Sober Curious. Yeah. Have you, have I know you, of it. It's a woman that wrote it, right? Yeah, yeah. and she was, she was actually like she's kind of the living embodiment of your career. Like, Rosie? Is that I her forget name? her name. Yeah. But anyway, she was a journalist. Yeah, London, Rosie Worthington or something. Yeah, she, and she was a But the whole thing about it is you don't have a disease, you've got bad habits, and if you set yourself rules, you're going to break those rules. Yeah. And just do it because it makes you feel better and it's in alignment with your values. And yeah. I'm no longer saying I'm not drinking or I'm drinking less or I'm drinking. There's just no rules. It's just about that. Choice. Choice Choose and space. the more charming option. There's a space, yeah, the more charming option. So Yeah, there's a psychiatrist that I saw, one of those psychiatrists that I shopped around with to really check if I was bipolar when I was 21. Mm. Um, he, I saw him for quite a while. He was a legend. Um, he actually invented the Huff and Puff classes for the Nursing Mothers Association. Yeah. Really weird story, fabulous. I saw him when he was in his 80s. And he taught me the idea. He was, he was really interested in neuroscience, well ahead of his time in this space. But he said you can't get rid of a habit, right? You can only build up another habit that is stronger. Than that. I love that. Yeah. It's so that's true. what I focus on. I don't try to get rid of what I am. Just I just to try to one. expand who I am so that it becomes a more healthy, more positive, more productive Incredible. approach. Yeah. yeah. And it works. Yeah. I want to ask you that when you were at the the depths of depression and and suicide and all those things, you talked about this is as bad as it gets. So let's just yeah. try and do something differently. And you've lived your life that way ever since, as I understand it. Can you just talk us through a little bit more, one, where that concept came from and two, the practicalities of how someone that was suffering like you were put that into play? Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I love how you bring the conversation back. Sometimes podcasts with me can just meander in all kinds of directions. Um, I like an anchor. Um, so, yeah, in that moment I, I realised that, you know, I had an out and so incredible freedom, you know, all of a sudden I felt unburdened. And then I realised, all right, if I'm going to just exit this mortal coil, what if I went over here and went, I could just choose to do life, not tell anyone, right, mm. not tell anyone and just do it my way with none of the bullshit rules and mores and conventions and pressures and capitalist concepts that that bogged me down and held me back and made me feel like I was living a half-life, you know. And, and so I just suddenly just elevated me and really it was it sounds like a miraculous piece of you know one of those you know deus ex machina moments where you know that people insert conveniently in a plot line but it it kind of happened like that and of course there was backward you know took a step back and two steps forward and then another three steps backwards over a number of years yeah. and I'll probably have to do that for the rest of my life yeah. but I suppose I made an internal commitment that right we're going to play this we're going to play this in a, a more interesting way, mm. in a more meaningfully wa meaningful way. And I'd already lost everything and I'd already So lived ground zero, like yeah. no money? Yeah. I, How I, were you paying your rent? Um, I had got to a point where I couldn't, so I actually ended up packing everything up and moving to Byron Bay. Um, I was in debt um, and that was because, unfortunately, a whole bunch of bills came in out of nowhere, but there was this incredible miraculousness and I... And I don't want to tell the story. It's in the book um, of the this, beast book. Yeah, yeah, this weird stuff that happened. As soon as I made this decision, I mean, the the very obvious one was two days later. Kerry Ann Kennelly rang me and said, "Could you come and fill in for me on her show? You know, I need a break." And she literally gave me two days to get in there. I was as sick as a dog. I don't remember any of it. I'd never hosted a TV show before. I don't know. I didn't even know Kerry Ann Kennelly. It was the weirdest thing in the world. I'd been on there as a guest to talk about bikini fashions when I was editor of Cosmo. Yeah. That was the extent of it. So that kind of, and then that led to um, the talent person for MasterChef seeing it because it was at Channel 10 Studios. She was the talent person there. And then, it, you know, one thing led to another. another and I yeah. dug myself out of my hole. Um, as I say, I went backwards a bit <laughs> and uh, before I went forwards. But it was it was a sort of a shifting forward. Um, but I held, I just, I guess I've made that commitment to myself and I realised you can, mm. you know, and um, 
to the second part of your question, you know, what are some of the things that I do now? It, it, what does it look like? Yeah. Um, I committed to never getting caught up in money or possessions or success. Um, and ironically, and this is how it generally plays out, I just made more money and had more success. And so then, perverse, isn't it? I, I know. A life, we forget that life is full of ironies and paradoxes. Mm. That's just the way it goes. We, we fight it all the time. And then, um, but then, of course, I started to get caught up in that. And I, you know, I owned a business in the end. So I quit sugar, developed when part of the experimentation to get better after I moved to Byron Bay, after I made this decision. And MasterChef happened in the middle of this. So it was happening at the same time. I was going backwards and forwards. And I started to write these columns about for a paper about getting better, and one of them was I quit sugar. Yeah, and so that developed into an ebook. You know, very early days ebooks. I taught myself how to make ebooks, and thought if I sell a hundred, I'll break even on this. And Twitter had just been invented, so I'd started tweeting things from my from my army shed in the forest where I was living in in Byron Bay or outside Byron, and then um, it just kind of grew and grew and grew. But then I got an accountant, and I had to say to him. He said, right, what are your financial goals? And I went, oh, Harry, we don't do this. We don't do no, this. No, wrong client. And he said, no, no, come on, make something up. We've got to work to something. My team need to know what we're doing here. And I said, all right, I want to be able to make enough money to live off the basic wage, CPI'd, for the rest of my life until I'm 94 in five years' time. So in five years' time, I want to reach that goal. And then everything I do after that, because I also knew that I had an illness which had rendered my grandmother and my uncle very unwell and premature death and they had to be looked after. And I didn't have that. I didn't have a partner. I didn't have kids. Yeah. I have a family that's split off and and we just don't have that dynamic where we go and nurse each other. Yeah. Um, Which is good, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. in some ways. Um, and also I'm the eldest child. Mm. You know, you just don't do that to the big sister, you know. She she does it to you. But um, I – so, yeah, I, I wanted to set myself up, but then I also wanted to make sure I didn't get caught up. Anyway, cut to exactly five years later, Harry rings me, goes, you made your goal a week ago. And I'm like, really? That's incredible. Because I had paid no attention. I still lived the same way I did. I don't – I haven't owned a car in years and I ride a bike and I, you know – when I, so I bought some apartments and, you know, to, to set myself up and um, each time the the bank loan dude had to come out and actually meet me because he didn't believe I spent so little. Um, and so Harry would send him out to actually look at my, my lifestyle. And during that time I was living out of two suitcases, you know, in temporary accommodation around the world. I didn't live in, and then it reduced to one suitcase and nobody could quite believe that my expenditure was- So low. So low, like a, like a well, I was going to say like a student, not today's student, like student from the 1990s. Like a, like a monk. <laughs> yeah, like a monk. Um, but nobody would have known, like, you know, I, I kind of, you know, smoke and mirrors. And so um, anyway- yeah, so it took a year of trying to get rid of the business and eventually I arrived where I am now where I gave away all my money. So I gave sold off the assets to the business and shut it down because I knew that I was just going to stay caught up in it, mm. trying to make leverage. Did, bus- you, did you sell it, I quit Sugar? I didn't sell it. Um, just- I sold off the assets. Yeah. So um, the recipes and so on. I've still got a tech platform that I need to sell if anyone's out there with a wellness program. Yeah. Um, and I just gave all that money to a charitable trust and now what I do is I make more money using the I Quit Sugar brand. I have a recommends tick that's on products and mm-hmm. all of that money goes to, into the trust, not profits, all of it. Yeah. And then I and then I pay it out to charity projects that I create or work on or believe are really legitimately engaged with the community because I don't want to just give money. I get the community involved. Mm. So they need to have an element of connection. And um, every six months I have a new charity and and so that's part of what I do now. What kind of charities have you supported? So there's one called World Bicycle Relief, which was part of World Vision, and we raised – so every dollar – what I'll do is get the community to kick in money because I just think everybody should be donating and then I match it dollar for dollar. So we raised um, – more than 700 bikes for two African villages where every girl gets a bike and it's the biggest thing to actually give women the biggest chance in life. So it's a, it's it, it fixes the HIV crisis, it fixes um, premature you know, death, um, death during childbirth because girls go to school, stay at yeah. school, et cetera. They don't get raped on the way to the, the farm or to the school. Um, 
and then it employs a mechanic who looks after the bikes, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a really beautiful thing and people, you know, there's it's almost like having a sponsor child because you actually get the photos of these people with their bikes and yeah. you, they have a big party to celebrate the bikes arriving and um, et cetera. So that was one. And then another one was making blankets out of wool that from Australia's last surviving wool mill down in Tasmania and it's the scraps off the floor. So they usually get tossed out. So we got them and made them into these new blankets and turned them into beautiful printed blankets. We sold them. And so you bought one and you'd buy one for another homeless woman in a yeah. refuge and you would have a little tag that tells you, you where the refuge is. So then if you've bought the blanket, if you, because we're all three paychecks from, the average Australian is three paychecks from being in crisis. And mm. so you then know where the refuge is, you know, yeah. and then I would match it dollar for dollar. So we ended up selling out in 10 days and we're going to try to do it again. We just ran out of wool scraps. <laughs> so, um, but I've been a bit bogged down with writing my, my next book and so the next project, um, I haven't quite finalised what that will be. Does your writing give you more joy than anything? Joy and frustration and pain and um, the whole thing, yeah, it's all of that. Yeah. Is it's, it, it's, it's life condensed down to, you know, pen and paper. Would it matter, like, to you what you were writing about, a bit like working at Cosmo, the, just doing it well, or uh, you really need to write about question. something you uh, actually yeah. you care I, about? I do love the art of writing. I love word construction and, you know, and the cerebral challenge of creating, you know, beautiful sentences. Yeah. Um, That's because you're cerebral. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And it's... it's um, yeah, it's it's a it's a really wonderful thing when you inside your head where it's it's a dance you can constantly play, is making mm. up wonderful sentences. You know, you can do it in the shower, you can do it anywhere. <laughs> um, but um, yes, it does matter what I write about. Um, yeah. Everything I do now, and it's sort of that 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 lens I put my life through back. You know, it was in my mid thirties, and that commitment I made. Um, that commitment has got stronger and stronger. So it's become an art form that I've had to kind of develop um, and or a muscle, you know, that yeah. I've had to grow. So now more so every day that passes, um, I become even more intolerant to anything that doesn't serve humanity yeah. and doesn't um, help and grow the spirit, mm. even if it's just my spirit. So yeah. anything, because I, I don't need to do... I, <laughs> I don't need to do anything, mm. you know. Um, so if I'm going to do something, it's got to it's got to feel purposeful. Yeah, no, I mm. get it. The I Quit Sugar came out of your own personal health. Obviously, you'd always been interested in health, the science, the applications, and I suppose most importantly, the the positive impact that had. Can you just talk a little bit to that? Yeah. Like on your own health to start, was it profound? And, yes. And is it something that everyone that's listening to that and all of their friends should be doing? Well, um, one of the things I always say is I'm not going to tell anyone to do anything. So it's no, the book's just called- just recommendation. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. <laughs> and it's I quit sugar. I gave it a go. Yeah. Here's what I learned. I kind of went down a bit of a rabbit hole. I'll save you the trouble. Here's the information. Try it if you want to, yeah. you know. And I've really tried to keep to that because it's back to what you were saying before. Rules just make you not want to do it, mm. you know. Um, it's actually got to be enticing and sort of make sense and you've got to come to it yourself. With anything that's addictive, you've got to make that choice, that yeah. choice to accept it. And, you know, as we know now, now, sugar is highly addictive. Um, so, and it's got to be treated as such rather than this kind of, you know, oh, um, well, you should do this, you should do that, or what the sugar industry does, which is to blame people for not doing enough exercise, you know, as though that's going to fix it and it won't. Or uh, fat. Exercise or fat are the two ones the sugar industry like to blame for everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. And they're, it's, they're, it's so transparent now. We can see exactly what they try to do. But, um, yeah, for me... Um, I was a gnarly sugar addict and the worst kind, and the worst kind is the person that, and this was pre-green smoothies and, you know, acai bowls but this, <laughs> um, and, you know, lots of yoga leggings in your wardrobe. But I, um, you know, I was doing the granola, putting the banana and sort of dates on it and then I was having dark chocolate several times a day and then I was yeah. having the healthy high-fibre muffin as a 3 p.m., you know, slump Pick fixer, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and doing all these things and, and the idea of not eating something sweet after dinner horrified me, yeah. absolutely horrified me. Um, 
And it's, it's quite funny to think about now. And anyone who's had any kind of addiction, the idea of not having a drink tomorrow horrifies you. It's, mm. it, it's almost unfathomable. And so, um, and, and, you know, not being able to have a, an 11 p.m. thing to look forward to. Like there was all these little touch points that I thought I wouldn't be able to do. And, you know, with that so-called healthy sugar kind of intake that I described, it added up to about 30 teaspoons of added sugar a day. And, of course, like many, and I was having chai with honey in it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, anybody who's in that realm will convince themselves that they're having healthy sugar. And people still come up to me and go, oh, but what about natural sugar? I'm like, it's what's sugar. unnatural about sugar cane? Yeah. You know, and arsenic and petroleum are natural. Yeah. This doesn't mean you need to eat it. Everything's natural yeah, if you go no. back to the source. It's like plant-based. Yeah. Um, I'm plant-based. Don't stop um, me. Um, so I... Yeah, so I had a gnarly addiction. I had to really work through it. It was really tough. But within two weeks, I started to notice distinct differences. Did you do it on willpower at the start or were you doing it I on mindfulness? I researched the bejesus out of it. I can imagine. And I did it as an experiment where I thought I'd just try it for two weeks. Yeah. And I had a st- and it was for a story, for a column. So I had to. It was kind of mm. good. And I don't know if I would have done it otherwise, to be absolutely honest with you. And then and then I sort of kept going and going because you do get the results. You get a result in two weeks and that is, and it appeals to your vanity, your skin changes. Yeah. Almost like, and people notice it. Mm. And so that was enough to keep me, I'm like, shit, if that's what I get after two <laughs> weeks, let's see, you know. And also my inflammation yeah, really, really fine. changed. The brain fog and the inflammation... So to answer your question, should everyone quit sugar? I would say the only thing, the only should I would th- throw out there is that if you've got any kind of inflammatory disease, an autoimmune disease, I'd say it's non-negotiable. Yeah. I'd advise that it's non-negotiable. But that's virtually everyone, Sarah. It like, is these days, isn't it? Yeah, like yeah. everyone, whether it's aches and pains, which are for the main part, unless it's an injury, are just inflammation. Well, even if it's an injury, it's still inflammation, well, right? Well, it is, yeah. yeah. You know, so while you say if you've got any autoimmune or inflammation, then that is all of the Western world. It is. And the serious ones, the metabolic diseases that we now, obesity, di- type 2 diabetes and so on, they um, they now, the links to sugar are absolutely known. Our new Australian of the Year, Dr. James Muwaki, I think, yeah. he... He's said, you know, like he got the prize for his work with um, vision and the connection with type 2 diabetes. And he said, right, my number one priority is to tackle the sugar problem in this country because that's what's causing it. Mm. That is what's causing the most amount of blindness in this country. It's fascinating to me that the solution to so many of the problems of the world, the big ones, obesity, disease, environment. Live it, yeah. All come from things that are free, yeah, or actually nothing. Fasting, meditating, less, less just sugar, less. less alcohol, yeah, less meat, less consuming, in- less consuming consumption. Full stop. Yeah, but everyone will go. I can't afford to do that. We live in a more more model, yeah, and so we can't even fathom less. Mm. It's a really hard thing. And you're right. I mean, everybody says I can't afford it, and I'm like. Well, hang on. This is cheaper. Yeah. Stop eating one meal a day. Like that's a third of your food bill gone. Yeah. One hit. Yeah. You're gonna live longer, feel better. Stop snacking. That's the real. Stop snacking. Six meals a day. Like, well, well, there there was a food company that came up with that concept. Kellogg's came up with breakfast. Like, yeah, yeah. You got to get more curious. That's right. The the snacking thing actually came about in the early 90s when nutritionists, so it was nutritionists that had to kind of formulate it because they were having all these clients come to them with um, sugar slumps and they couldn't get from, you know, uh, breakfast to lunch to dinner without having to snack. And so what they- (laughs) But that's just a complete lack of wanting to be uncomfortable for five minutes. Well, it's also because sugar was on the increase. spike and done. Yeah, yeah, I get it. So you can't, yeah. Yeah. It's like throwing caro on the fire. You've got to keep, keep adding, you know? And so these nutritionists went, oh God, what are we going to do? I know. Look, split those meals you eat across the day. Mm. So have six meals a day. Now they didn't say have those meals and snack in between. They said split your meal. So it was a fix to a problem. Now, what happened is you're right. The the companies came in, saw an opportunity and went, let's kind of corporatize the bejesus out of this snacking thing. Mm. And so what did they do? They made sugary, high carb um, snacks. Yeah. And um, that's what we snack on. I don't know anyone who eats half of their lentil salad 
for morning tea and then eat the other half. No, no one does that. No, no one, one does even it, yeah. snacks on celery sticks. People yeah. snack on sugary stuff. And so, of course, that just added fuel to that metabolic fire. You mm. know, it was just like create, you know, ex- um, made the, the problem worse. But people still think that it's healthy to eat five, six times a day. It's not at all. It yeah. was a fix to a, a, a problem and it only made the problem worse. Yeah. So there's so many things like that, you know, that um, – and when I started out in 2011 talking about this stuff, um, you know, I was pulled apart. I, You know, the science was there, but it hadn't been um, put into scientific publications because there's no vested interest in, um, you know, commercial interest in no, proving that sugar, because sugars make the food profitable. Mm. So there was a lot of studies trying to counter anything that these scientists were trying to show about. And the whole etiology of sugar science has been about corporations buying out the science and burying it. Very much like the climate movement today with the gas, the oil companies buying out the science and burying it. Mm. And this is what they do. This is their number one tactic. And when they get found out for that, they go to something else. And in fact, the tactics being used right now are the same tactics that were used for tobacco and sugar. Mm. So um, it's just history repeating itself, but we're getting a bit alive to it now. So um, yeah, for me, it was all very new. I was pretty much like trolled and bullied and all of that kind of thing. Copped it pretty bad, including mm. people paid for by Coke. So there were people out there who set up fake accounts and their job was to go at me, um, which, you know, which is really interesting. I would call them out and offer to meet with them for a coffee. And then yeah. I'd had dietitians who were also paid for by big food companies who would come out in the media and they look like they're impartial scientists, Mm. you know, coming out against this flippity gibbet master chef Cosmo thing who doesn't know, she mustn't know what she's talking about. And, um, and so it was a very easy, you know, juxtaposition. And, but then I'd say, well, I'm very clearly just selling a book. I'm not, I've got nothing to hide. I'm selling a book. This person over here is saying to the world that they're an impartial scientist, but they're paid for by Nestle. Yeah. So, you, you or it know. goes back even further. Like if you look at most of the major universities, the, oh, yeah. the major benefactors to most of the universities are those companies also. And in particular, the dietitian and nutrition schools. Yeah. Um, if you go and have a look at their very large uh, research centres, the buildings themselves, mm. have a Sponsored ask around. By the <laughs> ask around who paid for it. Sponsored yes. by Mr. Coca Cola. <laughs> Or just even a sugar company. Yeah. yeah. It's as direct as that. Yeah. How strict are you with it these days? Pretty loose. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, it's funny, you know what? People think um, that I'm vegan. Some people think I'm paleo. Um, they think I don't drink wine. They think I don't drink coffee. And I've never been that person. Um, so I, um, we, we can handle about six teaspoons of added sugar a day. And if you can modulate. What's a teaspoon in grams? 4.2. Most 4.2. Pe- okay. Most people can only think in teaspoons it's funny that you go to grams um so so six teaspoons four so about 24 grams a day yeah yeah that's right of added sugar added sugar yeah. not natural sugars well like we say it's all natural but um as opposed I to mean, eating whole fruit not including whole fruit i mean that's what i mean by yeah, natural but sugar it does include fruit juice yeah so these, yeah yeah no no absolutely yeah. anything that hasn't been processed includes through a food processor or a juicer yeah, so so um, this this was something that I came out with based on science. It wasn't my idea off the top of my, my head at the time. So there was science going around that I felt was really convincing and it was pretty extensive that showed um, six teaspoons for women, nine for men and about, uh, you know, it's about three teaspoons for children. Yeah. And um, and included, including that is fruit juice. Fruit juice f- sort of cup for cup is the same as Coca-Cola. Mm. So you know, 375 mils of juice will be around about eight teaspoons of sugar. So you've you've gone to your limit for the day. 32 grams. Yeah, you've yeah. gone to your limit, like in one glass Spike, of yeah. orange or apple juice. Um, so, But whole fruit's different because you can't eat, generally people don't eat seven apples in a row, you know. Yeah. You don't just sit there and eat that and you've got the fibre that slows down the, the its passage and, yeah, yeah, to, to, it. your, um, to your liver. So um, the main thing with quitting sugar is to get off the addiction cycle so that your hormonal system particularly that controls appetite, can recalibrate. So your ghrelin and your leptin um, hormones, which exist to tell you when you're hungry Mm. and when you're full, 
right? And they're fabulous hormones when they work well. They work in children. We see children just immediately get hungry and yeah. then they're full and they just have to stop eating and then they'll be hungry again when it's appropriate for them. We've lost that ability because of sugar. Sugar deranges that mechanism and it interferes with it. That's a good word. Yeah. yeah. So, um, And then there's a whole range of other cascading things that it does. Sugar, fructose specifically, which is the bit of sugar that we're concerned about, it's not metabolised like glucose, which is the other half of the sugar molecule. Glucose is great. It's in most foods. We need it for energy. It's metabolised as our cells. And we Particularly use the brain, yeah? Yeah, well, yeah. But, yeah, everything. but everything, yeah, yeah anything with mitochondria, yeah. Correct, it yeah. passes through our cells, whereas fructose is processed by the li- predominantly by the liver because it's deemed as a toxin like alcohol. So it processes it like alcohol in the liver and when the liver gets too much of it, and it can work quite well if there's a little bit of sugar, mm. but what the liver does, and again it's an evolutionary response, is it stores that fructose as visceral fat. So it doesn't pass off as energy, or not all of it does. A lot of it gets stored as visceral fat, which is that fat around your organs, beer belly, yeah, yeah, and then around your jawline. Again, your organs. Yeah. So that so sleep apnea and all those. Yeah. Exactly like having a beer belly. Yeah. It's the same response because that's what your body's doing with alcohol. It's what it does with fructose, um, and so. Yeah, that's the problem. The problem, I don't go sugar's just bad because it's addictive. It's actually addictive because for very good reasons. Why would our body do this? Mm. Well, it's because there was very little fructose on the planet when we were evolving, you know, back for most of our existence, in fact, up until about 150 years ago. And so it made sense that when we found something that was such a good converter to, like, fat, like it's immediate. Yeah. Right? The liver passes it into visceral fat before you've put your glass of orange juice down. Yeah. And so that's a fabulous thing when you're living. Commercially. Well, commercially. Yeah. But back then, when oh, you're living when you, in savannas and, and there's very little food, food and you'd find a wild berry bush, you were programmed. We still are programmed. We've got the same programming to binge the crap out of that bush, right? Yeah. Or the honey hive or whatever. And so we've got that mechanism in our brain that makes us gorge on it, Mm. be addicted and obsessed by it because it is the fastest, most efficient source of fat on the planet. Got it. So, um, and the irony is, of course, the diet industry, when they were creating all their diet foods and still do, they put sugar in, Mm. right, thinking take the fat out, put sugar in instead. But, of course, sugar is more fattening Mm. than fat. And we know this, right? You know, fat is not fattening. It is if it's sitting on a plate, but once we metabolise it, because you know what, we're a little bit more complex yeah. than black and white things like that, it, it metabolises very differently. So quitting sugar rebalances all of that kind of thing and it can actually get the, the, the derangement back in order so that you are actually capable of modulating your sugar consumption. So I can do that now. But I choose my sugar to be in the form of dark chocolate. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And also on the eight-week program, we also allowed um, a glass of red wine each night yeah. and there was science behind that and the reasoning. So everything that was on there, first mm. of all, looks extremely reasonable. It looks like the way your grandmother used to eat, right? Yeah. Secondly, it was all backed by science. Every single little thing I had on there was um, approved by various dietary guidelines around the world and then also was backed by as gold science as you can get in the nutritional realm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, today I eat... Eat, I eat dark chocolate for breakfast and everyone goes, what? Yeah. I'm like, well, that's what works for me. I just yeah. know it does. Um, I don't tend to have a big breakfast because I'm just not hungry then. Mm-hmm. I've got a metabolism that gets hungry at about 12 and I have a big lunch and I have a big dinner. Yeah, got it. And the rules that say that that's not the way to go don't work for me. Yeah. And the glass of wine? How, yeah. do, you, how do you moderate one glass of wine? Well, one of the fortunate things of having an autoimmune disease is I know that if I have more than one, it it will wreak havoc with my inflammation. And I've learnt that. So why have one? Because I love it. Oh, well, the science also shows this is the other thing. Yeah. We can break it down. I have T fighter cells that are a particular kind. I can't remember if they're one or two, but let's call it one for argument's sake. If you've got T fighter cells, like it's to do with cytokines, essentially red wine and also dark chocolate and coffee, fortunately for me, actually modulate um, those fighter cells that come in and will cause inflammation, the the antibodies that come and attack and cause inflammation. Other people, for them, they respond really well to echinacea, olive leaf extract and green tea. And I'm so glad I'm not in that camp. (laughs) (laughs) It's a dark straw, isn't it? I know, I know. Although the people who 
um, are in that camp generally really like green tea and can't cope with chocolate coffee. and coffee, right? Oh, shit myself. The poor things, yeah, yeah. I know. But, um, and look, at, people should listen to it because they do have reaction and we know people who have reaction to coffee, chocolate and red wine and they might want to switch over to these other things and mm. it'll actually modulate their tea fighter cells. Green tea, olive leaf extract, what was the other one? Uh, echinacea. Echinacea. They're just the okay. three I remember. There's a lot yeah, more. there's a lot more, okay. Yeah, and I feel sick having those things. I actually gag in my throat, I, you know, and yeah. green tea I just can't tolerate yeah, as much as I'd ever. love to. But um, so... Yeah, but red wine, the benefits um, of the resveratrol and so on of red wine um, in the digestion of your meal actually outweigh any calories or anything like that that um, that might be there. And one glass can actually um, yeah have really great benefits. Mm. More than that will push limits. Um, and there's very little sugar in red wine. It's yeah. the um, it's actually the fructose that uh, re- it becomes alcohol. Yep, got it. So white wine, there's a lot in there. Champagne and, of course, dessert wine speaks for itself. So yep. lots of residual sugar in those things and it's red wine specifically or white spirits. Yeah. Beer is also um, okay because it's maltose, the sugar in, in that's maltose. But remember, it still has to go through that liver pathway. Got it. But our bodies can handle one glass, yeah. just like it can handle a little bit of sugar, mm. drip fed, you know, throughout the day, six grams, six Yeah, teaspoons. I think it's just those people, me included, that, that the idea of one is like, are you out of your mind? Yeah. Like, yeah. And that's a challenge. Yeah. Because again, back to what you said before, habit, you need to replace it with something else. Until Correct. you do, you'll have that neural pathway. Yeah. My um, neural pathway goes, if you have two, you will feel like hell in the morning. Yeah. It is as good an incentive as any, you I know. I can imagine that yeah. hole you went down, no one would ever want to go yeah. down again. Yeah. But it's about modulation in the sense that you can remodulate the endocrinal system so that you have a better capacity to make those choices and then to build that bigger muscle. Mm. And so going cold turkey for the eight weeks, the 60 days more specifically, is um, the best way to give your, yourself the chance to then make a choice about how much sugar you're going to eat going forward. Yeah, and choice is empowering. Like I think that's yeah. the, the thing that when people do make those changes and they realise I am choosing to do it now, it's not because I'm addicted to it, however you want to define addiction, that yeah. it, it is a very liberating way to live. And look, what I do, Paul, is I tend to – because they're addictive substances, I can veer. Over Christmas, I started to creep my way up and I was feeling relaxed. I was camping with my brothers and my sister and my godson and, um, you know, not much going on. So I would have two glasses a night and that wasn't, you know, every couple, it was every night. Mm. And so just like everybody at this time of year, you know, like the new year, um, of course, in Australia, we don't think the new year starts until February, you know. <laughs> Australia Day. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's the, that's yeah. the new, that's 27th is the new year. Um, I, you know, I just had to go off it Cold for turkey. a week. Yeah. And sometimes I only have to go off it for three nights and I'm fine. You're and back. I'm back. Yeah. And I've, I, you know, I'm now I'm drinking a glass every second night. And I'm probably and creep enough. up. Yeah, and that's yeah. what I do with coffee as well. I just have a day off, two days off, and then just I treat it as a gentle experiment. Yeah, and when I just do it like that, because one day with is easy. Yeah. I get through one day and then I go, ah, oh, mm. kind of feel like doing two days now and then three, you know. Yeah, which is kind of the right philosophy, isn't it? Like forget this whole I'm never drinking again. Suck what? it and see. Suck it and see. Suck it and see just if you today. feel better. Or this party or this meal. Yeah. Just do it and be a renegade experimenter. I yeah, love going to a same. party and being the person in the room who doesn't have a drink. Mm. And I won't necessarily arrive thinking that, but I'll just go, ah, oh, let's mm. see let's see what happens. Yeah. You know? you know the one that worked for me was the fact that eighty percent of the population do drink. And so if you wanna be edgy, you gotta not drink. Oh, oh, yeah. ah. You're sounding old now when you're trying to make things like that sound cool. <laughs> Be the I cool am old kid. to start <laughs> with. <laughs> I've crossed that 50 barrier. So yeah, like it's just cruising I'm, towards it. I've embraced it. <laughs> what about meat? You don't eat meat? Yeah, I do eat meat. You do eat yeah, meat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, people, she's not a vegan? No. No. No, definitely not a vegan. Um, I looked into this research very, very deeply. I went to the CSIRO. I got the MLA to take me out to farms, um, both grain-fed, grass-fed. I went out to poultry farms before I put together the eight-week program. And I think I anticipated food trolls Mm. well before they were invented um, because I just wanted to make sure I saw with my own eyes. And I grew up, you know, we 
eight hour goats. So I, I sort of know what goes on. You're connected. Yeah. yeah. And, um, but it was a really interesting process. But then I also spoke to scientists at CSIRO in and around the ethical, the environmental and the health ramifications of, of meat production in Australia specifically. Yeah. Now, one of the problems is, is a lot of the information that we hear meat versus no meat is um, does come from overseas where the farming practices are distinctly different. Yeah. And, of course, they refer to the f- worst of the farming practices. Um, and, you know, there's there's nuance to this debate, probably more so than any other food debate. Um, and almost, look, there's I have a lot of respect for vegans, particularly at the moment, because I think the argument from a sustainability point of view as a mass concept really stands. However, that... I'm not sure about that, but continue. Well, if we work in a world where we've got meat production and yeah. and sort of vegan protein production existing as it does, yeah. although I agree with you because the vegan protein production element, if we're to go mass, is just not sustainable and particularly when we see um, big food coming in mm. and owning that market. And so we now see a lot of studies, you know, we're, we're seeing what happened with sugar, tobacco, et cetera, oil industry. Yeah. We're seeing there's a vested interest now, people might think the meat industry has money. It really doesn't, okay? No, not compared to the Not compared plants. with the junk food. Oh, yeah. The yeah, junk food yeah. industry. So, junk food now is coming in and yeah. able to own. They can't own a meat patty, right? Mm. But they can't. you can't make that any cheaper and more profitable unless you're McDonald's. Yeah. Even then, they have limitations. Of course. But you can go and take a pea and add a shitload of, you know, Sugar and, and preservatives. Yeah. 22 and, in most of those plant-based products. Yeah. Yeah. You can do a whole heap of stuff yeah. to it. Patent it. Make it super cheap and yeah. then market the hell out of it. Plus, you've got all this money to go and fund research to show that the vegan diet is the way to go. Mm. So, I am very wary when I see the studies. I always want to look behind. And, of course, I'm sure you've watched The Game Changers. I'm sure you've talked about it ad nauseum. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you've probably listened to some of the podcasts that actually break Post, it down in yeah, a very... Chris Cresser. Chris Cresser on yeah. Joe Rogan, I think, is one of the best for yeah. just breaking it down. Yeah, I um, think the second one he did with, with the James actual on James, there was yeah. uh, just a street fight and he got hammered. But Yeah, but the... Um, <sighs> Because it's, it is nuanced and it requires a calm debate because as yeah. soon as you start to get heightened, you can you can bring out blanket statements that out of context, yeah. Sweeping, yeah. You know? So I pull back from all of that. Mm. I've done all the research, including finding Same. out that, you know, um, the amount, you know, for calories for calories, protein for protein, which is what we talk about when we're talking, comparing yeah. like with like, if we're going to talk about viable dietary options. Um you know, there's an argument that in Australia, um, a vegan-based diet will um, kill 20 times more animals, sentient yeah. beings, than a meat-based yeah. diet. Um, and people go, well, how's that possible? Well, it's the native animals that are, are killed for the clear felling and it's rats and mice. Rats and, and so mice on. and birds and fish because most plants need herbicides and pesticides. There's very few And the organic- storage requires killing a lot of rodents. A lot of it comes from that. Now, somebody- and we don't have most of our in Australia and many places, most land that we have available for growing crops, we're already growing crops on it. Yeah, we and don't. We don't grow crops for animals. Like farmers grow crops for humans because it's way more profitable. The only crops that typically go to animals are the ones that are not digestible by humans. They're not fit for human consumption. Yeah. Like, and there, there are exceptions to that. So before someone jumps down my throat and tells me that's bullshit, there are yeah. exceptions to that where big industrialised animal agricultural practices grow crops specifically for that. But that's we should be arguing about that. Yeah, we of should be we should. we should be fighting against that type of farming. Yeah. The other thing that I come, the other point of view that I come from is that the far bigger concern from um, ethical, environmental, and also health point of view, perhaps not health so much, but the other two, which I think at the moment are more important than anything, mm. is um, food wastage. Yeah. And um, if you really want to combat all the issues that people tick off in this debate. Don't waste food. Any food. Any food. Yep. But I would say meat in particular. So the way we eat meat is wrong. Let's yep. talk about that. 
I can talk about that forever. I think it's a far more interesting discussion. Yeah. Um, we waste a lot of it. We eat premium cuts. We don't know how to cook it properly. Um, we probably do eat too much of it and mm-hmm. then throw too much of it out. Too much of the bad type of it, I think, is well, my we thing. We eat too much premium. I think there's ways of also <sighs> extracting mm. more out of your meat, slow cooking, of course, broths. all cuts. All this yeah. kind of thing. You know, and you and I are going to have maybe a slightly different approach to things, but we're talking the same stuff. Yeah. It is a product that should be revered, and I think we can all agree with that, vegan or otherwise. It's yeah. a life has been has been you know taken for yeah. this. But to your point before, Sarah, I think the thing that not all but a lot of vegans need to understand that nothing, nothing can. Everything requires the death of animals. You, for you to live, <laughs> something has to die. Yeah. It's just the evolution of life. That's so right. people just need but to. The way we go about it. We can be, there is room to be way more humane, mm. way more ethical, yeah. way more efficient, um, way healthier and sustainable. And it doesn't mean it's meat versus no meat, mm. you know. So there's way more interesting discussions to have around it. And I'm, I'm Practices. just Practices. It's, yeah. yeah. You know, what's that? What's that? the one that um, the woman that's doing the sacred cow documentary, she talks about it. It's not about the cow, it's about the how. Yeah. And and that's the thing. That's the conversation we're having. And even sustainability, we don't even use that language anymore because if we sustain what we've got now, we're still in trouble. You yeah. know, like they're talking about 60 more harvest until the soil has yeah. no more nutrients. Yeah. And, and then we're in all sorts of trouble. And so, I'd say that's even a different picture now in the face of the droughts and the wildfires. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So it's got to be the chat around poly versus monocultured farming and regenerative, regenerative. versus industrialised farming. Unfor- and then what else you should do? And that's on the both the plant side and the animal side. Correct. Yeah. I mean, um, I think this is the discussion we need to be having. Unfortunately, the word regenerative farming is just, I mean, you know, it's it's a it takes a little bit more to explain what it's about. Yeah. And then um, whereas a blanket statement like not eating meat, mm. it's it's simple, you know, and And it's fashionable. There's a certain there's absolutely an yeah. element to that. It's but, a privileged white individual's diet. Yeah, and Unfortunately, um, it's also the it's the diet of the food industry as well. We're sucked in, and I I'm not saying that there's vegans out there. There's vegans out there who've made done a lot of research and they've made their decision, and um, I really respect them when they can talk to me about it. Me too. You know, it's I find it fascinating and interesting because they can talk nuance. Mm. And the problem is, is when we make any kind of blanket statements um, that don't go into the details. And um, and don't actually look just you know further afield. Just over here, mm. they're far more um, effective and applicable and yeah. accessible solutions. So how do I eat meat? I I don't know if this is going to offend meat suppliers out there, but what I do personally, I shop at my local supermarket where they have a section that's got all the meat that's about to go off and it's 20% or 50% off. Yeah. All my meat's bought there and it's wrapped in plastic. I don't love it, but I figure it'll be thrown out the following day. So I buy it up and I have it in the freezer. Yeah. If you know how to use your freezer properly and thaw meat with respect, mm. <laughs> you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong. In, in fact, it's uh, perfectly fine. Yeah, um, of course. Y- you thaw your meat in the fridge, yeah. not on the bench, and you allow a good 24 hours for it to thaw out, you know, sometimes yeah. longer. Um, and and then cook it and then you can freeze it again, like cook in bulk. Mm. That's the other thing. Um, and then, you know, I will buy organic. I'll choose organic even within that realm, mm. partly because I've got the dollars to do it yeah. and I want to create the supply, you know, increase the supply demand equation. Um, even I know it's still registered when I've checked with my supermarket. They still register that you know that per- thing has been purchased, so yeah. it actually goes. Yep, there's demand there. Um, and um, I get inventive with meat, so I'll buy an organic chicken, and I've always advised doing this. Um, invest is. Invest in a, a good chook, you yeah. know, respect it, pay premium. Yeah. And then um, I've got a recipe in, in one of my books, in fact, two of them, I Quit Sugar f- for Life and Simplicious Flow, where I show you can get 14 meals out of the one chicken. Chicken, yeah. You know, and this is how our grandmothers used to cook. Mm. You know, you would max the hell out of those bones, the cartilage. Yeah. Don't go off and buy your collagen powder when you can just boil the crap out of your bones. bones yeah. 
The other thing I do, and it's become a, th- a meme, you know, a thing, um, when I'm at premium restaurants and that I know the meat's really good, yeah. I will... Just from Vicks. Uh, yes. <laughs> good, nice, nice little drop in there. Um, I, I will see somebody with their big T-bone and I will take the, I'll ask if I can have the bone. Yeah. So this has become a thing. There's a couple of restaurants around town that are really great and they serve those big cuts of meat where you share yeah. it between three people or whatever. And I watch people not eat it all. It kills me. So I ask if I can have it. Bones, yeah. I'll take the leftover meat home and I'll turn it into a salad, you know, like a Thai salad or something the next day yeah. with, with acid in it. And then I'll um, boil the crap out of the bones. And I've also been known to then take the broth back to the person, the customer who, if they're regular or I'll leave it, I'll say, I'm going to leave you a jar of this stuff yeah. in four days' time. Come and get it, you know. Um, it's it, it, change one one person at a time, you know, one jar it's, of broth at a time. That's all we can do. But what that does is a talking point and then people start to think about things and then I say, oh, there's a recipe for it in my books or on my website for free. Yeah. Um, give it a go. And that does ripple around. So, that's how <laughs> I eat scrap meat, basically. Mm. And when I go out, I, um, I'll i often choose meat, but I, I, I go out to places where I know they are actually really, really supportive of farmers and they're mindful and I'll never, you know, and and they're supportive of local and grass-fed and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And there is Wherever definitely a movement, you know, and we were chatting with Anthony before the show that – more and more people are getting behind it. And when you chat to the likes of the Joel Salatins and mm. the Savory Institute and those people that really are at the pioneering end of this, they will tell you that the needle has moved and that that early adopter phase is now becoming more mainstream. So it's yeah. it's encouraging. It's just how we go about getting consumers to drive practices of restaurants etc because i get the challenges that restaurants have in particularly in this country where wages are so high that the margins are so slim and so they've got to compete you know with down the road who are charging 34 dollars already for a steak Mm. um yeah and no i get it as well it's got to be systemic and it's got to be we've just got to get a groundswell and it really begins with having considered kind gentle debates where some of these more delicate issues can come through you know and it's not raging and it's not black or white it's got to stop doesn't it Mm. you know like i saw that dr sean baker the other day who's right at the other end on the carnivore and he posted a, a message he got from a, a bodybuilder that was a vegan and it was it was disgusting like i'm gonna kill you you're a murderer mm. and it was like wow that's like, horrible it's horrible and it doesn't fix anything like it, it's just about informing so that if people do want to be vegan or vegetarian, mm. then just understand that there are there are costs everywhere, including to your own health and including to the health of the planet. So make a decision based on that knowledge, not yeah. because you think it's the right thing to do when in fact it may not be the right thing to do. Mm. And if you're going to eat meat, then again, if you have the ability to afford which I would say everyone does because you either pay now or pay later when mm. you get sick, is actually find out where that meat is from and support the sustainable farmers. And there's more and more of them in Australia. There's more like that beautiful documentary, The Biggest Little Farm. Have you seen it yet? I haven't, but I've, I've heard it's, about it, yeah. It, I, I think it's going to have a profoundly positive impact on on people understanding that Natural ecosystems include plants and animals yeah. and that's the only way that we're going to get out of this godforsaken hole that is climate change, that is obesity overlaid with malnourishment. And Yeah, yeah. food scarcity is going to be a really big issue. That's probably going to be the looming thing that we're not even talking about yet. Like what happens with this coronavirus? Like I... I, I the, I think this is, again, you know, God knows we've had, we've had probably two or three of them in the start of uh, a month in January Mm. of the world saying to us, you guys are in dire straits. Yeah, I know. Um, My next book covers off these quandaries and it's what's the next book called or you haven't named it yet? i haven't oh i do have a name but i don't think my publisher's given me permission to release okay. it yet but essentially i hike around the world um it's you know and i investigate philosophical and spiritual ways to come back to life to reconnect again um because that i think is at the core of why some of these issues are we, we we're just not embracing them being able to surmount them address them mm. um so rather than uh, a, a, an issues-based 
um, discussion. It's a values based discussion. So, yeah. but predominantly based around the climate crisis. Yeah. Do you think there are more women that are going down that route of veganism and vegetarianism than than guys? Or oh, the stats show a hundred percent that they are. But I also think some of the 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 we could say it's you know because of the it's fashionable or it's this or that. It might even be kind of dietary reasons, I think. Body image. Body image. Things, Although yeah. I don't – I think most people are pretty aware that it's not necessarily going to make you lose weight. I think that Maybe. that part of the discussion has 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 sort of left the realm um, fairly recently. But if they're doing it for environmental reasons, in terms of where the world's at, um, women are signed on to caring about what's happening in – the climate with the climate way more than men. men yeah. I mean, men are, are noticeably absent. Mm. And if you go to any of the rallies, if you you know, if you have a look at the voices in this area, it's predominantly women. The women are running these organisations. The women are caring. It's the female students that are heading the rallies. Yeah. Um, and you know, I have this discussion with a lot of men. You know, the good men in my life. I'm like, we need you. Yeah. Where are the men? Yeah. Come on. So um, I think that, to be fair, that that does trigger some of the move towards vegetarianism and veganism, if we're going to be balanced about this, yeah. is is a genuine care for the environment. Yep. Who are your go-to people, not just environment but health and spirituality and things that you go to for information, no, regardless of there being a relationship, what sources, what podcasts, what books yep. are you really? The Guardian. Yeah. Definitely. The Guardian Australia, the Guardian internationally for climate information. Yeah, I read I mean, it. It's good. Yeah. The Climate yeah. Council is an independent organisation here which provides kind of legit information. Independent NGO? Um, they're a not-for-profit. Yeah. And they were, I think I was saying earlier, they set up by the Liberal Party actually and then they got rid of it, defunded it, so they then continued it um, with philanthropy and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's still used by... Um, major organisations, media, journalists use it for as a source of credible information. Um, I also, Mother Jones, I think is fantastic in the US. I don't know it. Yeah, in terms of regenerative farming, but for health politics, it's another independent um, news source. It's been going for quite some time now. Really high-end journalists, they'll often break a story, but they break it down with fun stuff. And they also have a newsletter that delivers the good news that's happening. Yeah, nice. God but anyone who's interested in diet politics, they cover it off really, Mother really Jones. well. Mother Jones. I'll put all these up in the show notes. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, what else do I follow? Oh, there's a great woman in the US called Emily Atkin. She's got a newsletter called Heated okay. and she breaks down complex kind of environmental stuff but she's a really good journo and she's connected and she seems to know just about everything. Um, she does this newsletter which, again, all of these are subscription and mm. if you want to if you want to donate some dollars right now that's actually going to be effective for the future, donate in these great publications yeah. because they are not funded by multi-corporations and, and this is the media model we exist in the world today. So be generous, mm. like pay for what's fair. So I pay subscriptions on all of these. Yeah. Um, so Heated is a really great newsletter. Um, food stuff I've kind of backed off from that realm. It's just not where I I work in the in the climate side and all that kind of thing. Um, and I do listen to the podcasts. Um, let me see, podcasts, I tend to listen to more philosophical things like On Being um, is one of my favourites. Um, I do listen to a bit of Joe Rogan yeah, just to keep my doses. heart rate going. Yeah. Um, what's his, Mark Macron, what the fuck? Yeah. He's kind of quite interesting from time to time. Mark um, Macron, Mark Mason, Manson. No, it's Macron. Macron, is it? Yeah. Not the guy that wrote The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. No, that's Mark Manson. Mark Manson, And I don't okay. think he's got a podcast. No, I no. don't think so. He's a, great, he's a great writer. I like his books. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I have to throw in that he wrote a very great um, endorsement of my book. He wrote the best book on anxiety I've ever read. I mean, you can't. Mark Manson? Yeah. I actually saw that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, I was kind of a bit happy about that when he sent that to me. Um and uh, what else do I listen to? Yeah, um, 
if I think of anything else, I'll send you a list. But, yeah. yeah. What about Ariana Huffington's new Thrive Global? Have you followed I that? Follow, I follow a little bit of it, but not so much, no. She impresses me, but then I go, the Huffington Post was just such shallow bullshit that Started I- off good though. Yeah, And I still true. do. I, actually, one of the things I do read is there is a Huffington Post, I think it's called Long Reads, or it's got a- Huffington Post Highline is what okay. it's called, and it's really long reads that are investigative, and okay. they're really good. I like that. Yeah, yeah. So I that's actually one of the sources I go to, um, and 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 they're you know they're really really interesting. The New York Times um, for a bunch of their opinion writers. I yeah, read all their read opinions, those. and I listen to their daily podcast, which mm. is good. Yeah, they, um, their, their journalism is very fair, very committed, yeah. and. Yeah, I have, I have issues sometimes with how partial they get in politics, but I think in the US you sort of almost need to oh as, a, as a sort of a, a rebalancing like a mechanism. Yeah. Um, but one way or another, I mean, I, I sort of listen to, read, view, I mean, I watch, I watch Insiders mm. on Sunday mornings. I listen to Radio National every single day. Yeah. And from about 6 until 8.30 every day, they cover off stuff in such a nuanced way. They have incredible political minds, the best in the country, yeah. often from The Guardian and, and the ABC, breaking down the news stories. Um, so people have lost that interest. And I just really encourage, wake up, turn the radio on, have it on as you go about your morning. Yeah. Um, and Not Triple M. People, no. <laughs> real, <laughs> yeah. intelligent radio. The times are such that we have to know what's going on. Mm. And, um, you know, the bushfires and all the stuff that's happening, I think people are feeling really disempowered. Mm. And the only way to get empowered is, and in fact, I should actually point out that on my website at the moment, I have a reading list and it's step one in um People have been asking, what can we do? What can we do about this? What are some tangible, Sarah, tell us what are the tangible things we can do. And awesome. I've done step one in the process and that is learn, read and learn because, and I explain why that works and I've got a reading list on there. So there's my Love answer. It. Yeah, okay. It's got all those we'll links put it there. All, we'll put it all up. <laughs> yeah. And what are you doing other than riding your bike? What are you doing I'm editing the next, oh, exercise-wise? Yeah. Oh, um, I ocean swim. So I swim out at Bondi sort of. Uh, south to north yeah. um, a couple of times a week um, and I fly around and tell people I surf. Um, oh, I've never seen you out there. Yeah, no, I'm not good. Really? I talk about it more well, than I actually. Well, there's plenty of people that aren't good, so you just come yeah, see, out. See, see, see the whitewash that yeah, you guys, you generally out. jump off yeah. and then you swim out. That's, That's where, where I'm flying around. <laughs> um, I used to surf a bit more and, and then I got old. Um, and then, But I'm trying to get back into it. Get back so into I got it. I've borrowed, no. fo- borrowed a foamy from someone and, and sort of getting back into it. Um I ride my bike and walk for transport and that does a fair bit. I go to Pilates because nice. it's just changed. I needed to work on my posture and ensure Functional that. Movement. Yeah. Yeah. So I do a lot of Pilates and yoga. I've done yoga for years. Forever, so, yeah. yeah. What are you doing? Where are you doing that now? Um, I go to, at the moment, I go to Body Mind Life. Okay. Um, I really like the technicalities. The teachers are really technical. Mm. But I move around a little bit. Um, I like hot yoga because that just suits my constitution. Yeah, I'm a it. very vata type. Yeah. Um, even in the middle of summer, I just can't get enough of sweating. Yeah, it's good. Um, and then I, what else? I go to the gym as well. Again, I, I literally, I think I go in, I do my job. I'm not one of those people that sits there and fiddles around my phone or mm. grunts and swaggers around. I like I'm in and I'm out of there. Yeah. But I really enjoy opening up certain limbs and I love exercise. And then I hike. So I'll go on these big hikes every second weekend. At the moment it's tricky because so much of my hiking territory is gone. Do you go down south typically? I go everywhere. So I trains. So living where I live, I can get on a train to every just about every national park around Sydney and the hikes are all from train train stations. Yeah, got it. So on a Sunday I'll get up. I love it. I'll get up super early. I'll go out there. I'll go down to Royal National Park. I'll go up to the Blue Mountains where I used to. Um, Brisbane Waters, Coringai. Mm. But even in around Lane Cove, Roseville, there's these incredible walks that are part of the Great Northern Walk that goes yeah. all the way to Newcastle. They're incredible. Yeah, so if you want a website city. for that one, uh, Wild Walks. Wild it's, Walks. It's a free app and um, they have all the walks in the greater Sydney region and they're phenomenal. 
So, yeah, you can look and it'll tell you if it's train stop to train stop. They're yeah. the ones I like. So. Yeah. so anyone that's saying I don't have time to exercise, if they looked at your schedule, they've no longer got an excuse. Oh, the, the no time thing is is I, I don't care how busy somebody is. I mean, the busiest people we know can make time yeah. for mindful conversations or whatever it might be. So um, it's a choice. It's a choice. And I, I, it's, I've not come across a person yet where I buy the I've got no time mm. thing. Yeah. It's, it's you. It's prioritising. Yeah. Amen. Or leaning. I like the, no, the word the tilt. Well, the tilting. Uh, there was a, this is for a broader discussion. I, I cover it off in, in, in the book. But tilting is where instead of choosing one or the other and thinking, oh, my yoga quotient to my spending time with kids to, you know, office time quotients all out, which is what women tend to do a lot of. Yeah. Um, oh instead, God. this expert, Marcus Buckingham, said instead tilt. Instead of thinking you've got to do this or that, just tilt where you're required at any given moment. Mm. You know, lean towards what matters and and is charming. You yeah. know, and and feels like Gulps. it's serving something broader than your own selfish interests. Yeah, um, that's that's a good way to go about it. So exercise is something. It's kind of non-negotiable for me with autoimmune disease. I do it every day. And even this morning I mm. had to get on a conference call early, but I just got up and I did twenty minutes of sort of mat exercises i've got those it was those ferrobands yeah i just copy people at the gym i got sent something once from katmandu and i kind of worked out how other people I just copy them and i do the same thing at home yeah and i just do it for 20 minutes and that's fine you know you're amazing i don't know about that <laughs> i'm also really annoying <laughs> thank you so much for coming oh on, my Sarah. pleasure it's been amazing. it was a great chat thank you my pleasure too <laughs>